announcements you'll see on the cards, and you have most of the introduction to, uh, to Ray Kurzweil. Um, Eleven of you got copies <laughs> of his new book, The Singularity is Near Outside, because that's all the publishers sent to put all that in place. But uh, all that in place is just up the street, a block and a half, on your way out if you want, and uh, order a copy, you can do that, or you'll find it online. And uh, those of you who have copies, you're able to stick around for a little while afterwards and sign them, or some of the other books of his that are out there. I should announce that usually these seminars about long-term thinking or Fort Mason are usually on second Fridays. Obviously, they're not at Fort Mason. This is not a second Friday. It's a Thursday. And indeed, the next one will also be uh, in sight. It'll be Wednesday, October 5th. Uh, it's three speakers who've never been on the stage together before. Freeman Dyson, his daughter, S. Dyson, and his son, George Dyson. And they we put together the event around uh, the fun and the occasion of, of putting it together on stage. The subject is Freeman's, and he'll be the, the main speaker. And uh, the subject is um, the difficulty of looking far ahead. That will be back at Fort Mason. Unless one of you knows another large theater like this that can be got for October 5th, we're going to be in our old, rather small opinion of the uh, conference center at Fort Mason, which holds a small, smaller audience than about 310. So to work around on that so we don't have a real problem of people hoping to get in and being horribly surprised. Thank you. Is, uh, if you want to go to that talk October 5th, uh, the same time on a different station over at Fort Mason, call the Long Now office and just give them your name, how many seats you want. Uh, you can write it down, but it's 561-6582. And uh, that way you'll know for sure you can get in. We'll keep some seats for sort of standbys. And that particular uh, place, unlike this one, has windows to the outside. And so outside possibility, uh, we uh, still get a lot of people. We can hope that you can stand outside and see it here when you need to see it here. <laughs> so that's the workaround for that one. Uh, you may, I hope you all get the cards. They have the real introduction for Ray. They also have a back place for finessing the questions. So if during the talk or during the Q&A afterwards you have a question, go ahead and write it down. If you don't have a pen, pick one. And it's helpful if you put your name on there. And uh, if you want your email address, uh, email address will just get you on the mailing list of the forthcoming talks if you want. Some of the future speakers are Senator Clay Shirky, Sam Harris, uh, debate between, not debate, but discussion between uh, Peter Schwartz and uh, on nuclear power and climate change, and an amazing uh, show and tell about folly over the last thousand years. The way we get those questions to the front is, as you write them, pass them over to the aisle. There'll be some guys in yellow hats. Uh, we'll occasionally stroll up and down and collect those questions. They'll pass them to me. I'll pick out the really uh, difficult ones. Pass them on to Kevin Kelly, and we'll further set them to the really annoying. And that's uh, what I'm going to ask those of uh, uh, Array. <coughs> The attraction of the Long Now Foundation in this series of seminars about long term thinking is that the scope of, of Kurzweil's law, the law of accelerating returns, is about that of Darwin's idea. Uh, in this case, it's about pace rather than uh, how selectivity occurs, but it is a great big idea. And it's a great big idea that happens to be bearing down on us right now. Uh, Ray himself takes many of the things that he writes about personally, not only as an inventor, but as a person who would like to uh, move on toward immortality sooner rather than later. I just learned that while well, I'm 66 and take seven pills a day, just to maintain, he's 57 and takes 220 pills a day. <laughs> so lock and load, lock and load, drugs, and good to go. Ray. <laughs>
to a group that is considering long-term trends, uh, a lot of models of how the future will unfold, our linear models, uh, an exponential trend looks like a straight line, if you guys have a second of it, so all these government models that are linear, quite well for two or three years. Uh, it's interesting that to listen to the debate where we're talking about 2042, which is around the data brought for the singularity, where there'll be very transformative change and models have uh, longevity increasing by 11% and economy growing by 4%. I, actually, it's 2.7%, uh, even though we've seen higher growth than that in the last 15 years. Uh, I've been thinking about technology trends for many decades and I want to share some aspects with you. This, this building is not an interesting setting. So that's I wrote my 
first book, The Age of Intelligent Machines, based on these models, what they call the law of accelerated returns. It had hundreds of pictures about the 1990s and the over 2,000 years, which were considered quite radical back then, but it actually seems like a pretty wild one now. Visions like computers achieving Turing level, Turing test level.
first virtual reality technology where you could actually be with someone else, even though you were hundreds of miles apart, at least as far as the auditory sense was concerned, the telephone. Uh, that is actually how people in the 19th century viewed the telephone. As part of, as part of that, you actually had to be in the same room with somebody to hold a conversation. So now you can create these virtual spaces that took half a century to be adopted. Uh, more recent communication technologies like the web, personal computers, the internet, uh, the adoption by a mass audience, a uh, quarter of the U.S. population took only a few years' time. If we look at different communication technologies, uh, once earlier in the 20th century, television, radio, and telephone took decades. Uh, these more recent technologies are measured in a few years' time. Uh, these graphs, all of them except for one that I'll point out, are logarithmic graphs, meaning if you go up the y-axis, it represents increasing the number of powers of 10 multiplying by powers of 10 uh, at each level. Uh, so a straight line on a lot of the graph represents, represents exponential growth. Now this is an interesting graph. It just shows the basic acceleration in an evolutionary process. And biology is an evolutionary process, but so is technology. In fact, technology emerged in the biological process that, that led to uh, uh, technology emerged from the evolutionary process that led to the technology creating species. And evolution works by creating a capability, increasing complexity, but then increasing, creating a capability and then using that capability to create the next stage. That's fundamentally why an evolutionary process accelerates and why the fruits, the products of that evolutionary process at each stage get exponentially more powerful. The first stage in biology, in fact, the, the creation of biology, the evolution of biology, took billions of years to evolve DNA, actually, on an at first. So now evolution had a little computer system and information backbone to keep track of its experiments. It then used that to evolve the next stage, the Cambrian explosion, and all the body plans of the animals were evolved. Uh, that went 100 times faster. That only took 10 million years. Then that became a mature technology, in effect, and it used these mature body plans to evolve higher cognitive functions. Uh, biological evolution kept accelerating. Homo sapiens evolved in only a few hundred thousand years. Uh, there are actually only a few minor genetic changes that, from the earlier primates uh, to Homo sapiens. Uh, three of them. One uh, allowed a larger skull, uh, these guys having a weaker jaw. Other primates can uh, have a stronger jaw, but we have a bigger brain. More of that brain matter is devoted to uh, higher uh, cognitive functions with a larger cerebral cortex. And the third one was to move the pivot point of the thumb up one inch. Chimpanzees may look like they have some one hand, but they don't have a <coughs> uh, power grip, they don't have fine motor coordination. So now we had an opposable appendage that actually allows us to take our mental models of the world and actually change them uh, to reflect our sort of mental what if experiments. And that led to the creation of uh, technology, which was the next stage of this evolutionary process. So again, working by interaction, evolution used one of its products, the technology created species, to evolve the next stage. And the next stage went again about 10 times faster. Evolution of stone tools, fire in the wheel, early primitive technology took tens of thousands of years rather than hundreds of thousands. We then always used the latest stage of technology to evolve the next stage. Half a millennium ago, the printing press took, half, took a century to be adopted. Half a century ago, the first computers were uh, laid out with pen on paper and wired with screwdrivers. Now, a, we, we, we use computers many generations of advanced computer system design software where engineers can specify some high-level formulas and 12 layers of intermediate design uh, get implemented automatically. So we're always using the latest technology to create the next. The intellectual feats of human civilization today would be impossible without the integration with our technology. And interestingly, on this double logarithmic graph, it's a straight line reflecting this continual acceleration there's been a few arguments made with this chart. One saying, well, with the Cambrian explosion, it didn't take 10 million years, it's 25 million years. And the internet, you've got to include the ARPANET, so it's not 10 years, it's 25 years. Well, we make those changes, it still gets a straight line, because those changes actually don't affect uh, things on the scale of this chart. The internet didn't take a million years to evolve. The Cambrian explosion didn't happen in 15 years. Uh, the other objection is, well, I don't know if you points on this chart that, uh, that fit on the straight line. So I took uh, 14 different lists. These were not people trying to make them or, or unmake uh, my particular point. This is just what Carl Sagan's Cosmic Calendar, the American Museum of Natural History, the Encyclopedia Britannica, or these other thinkers and, and uh, reference works thought were the key events in technological or biological evolution. And 
you do see some spreading of the points, people do disagree about how long the cavern explosion took, when language started, what the events were, but you see an inexorable straight line. And it's pretty much uh, common sense uh, that things have accelerated. A billion years ago, not much happened in a billion years ago. For example, uh, if we put these events on the F, then it looks like everything's just happened. <laughs> process to time my own 
technology projects and also to develop business plans and to evaluate other people's business plans. Uh, I think it's a very valuable tool to really understand where computers and communication and biological technologies will be in three years and five years and really make you know, reasonable estimates. Uh, and if anything, the future will be more remarkable than anything we can imagine today because we're going to have everybody in this room and millions of other people using their creativity to apply these very powerful uh, capabilities. But even the mental experiments we can do today, what, what is feasible with these technologies, uh, is quite informative and, and formidable. Personal experience when I was at MIT in the 1960s, I got there 40 years ago. Uh, all the professors and students shared this one idea in 1794, 32,000 words of 36 bit memory. It's about 144,000 bytes. Uh, it's a quarter of a bit, much less powerful than the computer your cell phone today. It took up a room about this size, uh, $11 million in, in relative current dollars. Uh, there's been, just in terms of MIPS per dollar, there's been 24 doublings in 36 years. If you add the other levels of improvement, the vastly increased memories and input output capabilities, uh, you get a doubling of about every year. Uh, and here I put 49 famous computers on a logarithmic graph. Every time you go up one level of the y axis, it represents multiplying computational power by a factor of 100. It goes back to the first electric and data processing equipment using the 1890 census. Then you have really basic computers, like Allen Turing's uh, machine that cracked the German Enigma code. Uh, you have factor two computers uh, that we used to predict the election of Eisenhower in 1952, the first time the networks had done that. In the 1960s, discrete transistor computers used by NASA for the first space launches. And then several decades of integrated circuits. And you see very smooth, exponential growth. Uh, by the way, that's not a straight line. That's better than a straight line. It took us three years to double the price performance in 1900, two years around 1950. We're now doubling it every one year. There's a theoretical reason for that second level of exponential growth, the slow exponential growth, the rate of exponential growth. Because as an industry gets more cost effective, uh, it grows, and so we put more money into research and development. In the computer industry, such as it was, was a handful of governments war-related projects and academic projects in 1950. Today, it's a trillion-dollar industry. Uh, this is uh, Hans Moravec's uh, similar chart. These are different computers. Uh, he draws trend lines. The later he draws the trend line, the higher the slope, <laughs> representing this second level of exponential growth. Uh, and I'll show you quickly just many examples of electronics, but I particularly want to show you examples outside of electronics. But so, the interesting thing about this supercomputer chart is, uh, well, I, I put this together recently. Uh, it's in the book. It's already out of date. And that all the news that's come out just in the last few months, this book is, is better than what I projected. But this projects 10 to the 16, 10 quadrillion uh, calculations per second by 2013. That figure is significant because that's my estimate of the amount of computation required to functionally emulate the human brain. Uh, I have four different analyses by different researchers and research groups in the book that come out between 10 and the 14th and 10 and the 16th, so I pick 10 and the 16th to be conservative. If you were to simulate every nonlinearity in every dendrite in every neuron, it's 10 to the 19th, but I don't believe that's necessary. Uh, even if you had to pick 10 to the 19th, I don't delay it for quite a few years. But anyway, this comes out to 2013. Uh, just two weeks ago, Two different Japanese companies announced 10 quadrillion CPS supercomputers are, that they're building and will be ready by 2010. So uh, we will, we're on track here. Uh, <laughs> different uh, types of trends, dynamic RAM memory. Uh, actually, that's going through different technologies. This is an interesting chart. This is the average uh, transistor price. So in 1968, you could buy a transistor for a dollar. And actually, to back up further, when I was a high school student in the early 60s, I would hang out at <coughs> surplus electronic shops on Canal Street, and I'd buy something about this big, which was a telephone relay with support circuitry, equivalent to one transistor, only a million times slower than today's transistors, uh, for about $40. In 2002, you could buy 10 million transistors. It's now about 100 million transistors for a dollar. The interesting thing is, I mean, look at how smooth 
this trend is. I mean, you would think this is the output of some tabletop experiment, but this is a measure of a chaotic activity involving millions of people and hundreds of companies in many different countries and accusations of one country dumping products in another and economic recessions and conflicts and wars and uh, hurricanes and all kinds of things. And you have very smooth exponential progression. Uh, it's a pretty remarkable phenomenon. And we see it in any measure we've looked at having anything to do with information. Uh, unlike Gertrude Stein's roses, it's not the case that the transistor is a transistor. If we make them cheaper, they're better because they're smaller, the electrons have less distance to travel, so they're exponentially faster. Uh, you put those factors together, and the average uh, cost of a transistor cycle has been coming down by half every 1.1 year. Then you have all these other innovations like pipelining and data caching and other innovations in processor design gets done in one year. So we're doubling the price performance of electronics every year. And it's also true of other databases and software and other, other measures of information technology. That's 50% deflation. And I'll talk a little bit later about the economic implications because economists, depending on what we could do, is worry about deflation also. Uh, I mean, they'll make the point that, yes, it's a good thing if you can buy the same stuff for half the price uh, a year later, but that's going to lead to a shrinking of the economy, particularly as information technology becomes a larger and larger part of the economy. Right now it's 8%, it will be a majority of the economy work by the 2020s. So people will buy a bit more, but they're certainly not going to double their consumption uh, in, a, in a year. But actually what we find uh, is that we do better than that. We've had 18% compounded growth in dollars uh, for the last 50 years in electronics, despite the fact that you can get twice as much stuff uh, in every year. Uh, because every time price performance reaches a certain level, it enables new technologies. People didn't buy iPods for $10,000 10 years ago. Uh, and we're going to continue that process. We have a sort of uh, unsatisfiable uh, human uh, desire and uh, need for, for resources. Uh, the same, the lot of us are about the same thing. Now that one person could make clothing uh, at 10 times the rate of the levers prior to automation in 1900, it's going to lead to a total collapse of the economy and there won't be any jobs. But people didn't want just one shirt anymore. They wanted a whole wardrobe. The common man and woman also wanted well made clothing. Uh, and so we consume more as, we're, as price performance improves. And actually, keeps up with this, more than keeps up with this 50% deflation. So I put this chart up just to show you another random example. Uh, this is not Moore's Law. This is not shrinking transistors on a great circuit. This is magnetic disk storage. So it's shrinking magnetic spots on the magnetic substrates. Different technical problem, different engineers, different co companies, different countries, same exponential progression. A really significant one is biotechnology, biology. We're learning to understand and to reprogram biology as information processes. Biology is based on genes. Genes are little software programs. Uh, we have 20, about 23,000 of them. Uh, we haven't changed them recently. How much software do you have that you haven't changed in 30 months, let alone 30,000 years? We have programs like the fat insulin receptor gene that I mentioned, which basically says, hold on to every calorie because the next hunting season may not work out so well. <laughs> and that was a very good program 30,000 years ago when the calories were few and far between. We'd like to change that program. And as I mentioned, when we did that in mice, we got a good result. And we actually now have a means of turning genes off. This has just emerged in the last two, three years, RNA interference, where we have how the medication doesn't have to go to the nucleus, which is hard to get into, just into the cell, which is easy in supplement or medication gets into the cell. And we'll latch on to the messenger RNA expressing the gene and destroy it prevent that gene from being expressed. So we have the means now of turning genes off. There are a lot of genes we have identified that are necessary for atherosclerosis and sorts of heart, heart disease to progress, for cancer to progress. Really every major disease utilizes a number of different genes uh, in order to go through its cycle. Uh, so there are many very exciting developments now using RNA interference to turn those particular disease-causing genes off. Uh, 
the similar diseases, uh, genes for promoting aging, uh, and so on. Uh, there's some exciting new methodologies to turn genes on or to add new genes or modify genes. Gene therapy has been plagued by trying to send genes into viruses and then they end up in the wrong chromosome in the wrong place. One exciting new technique is to take a cell out, uh, modify its, its uh, DNA in, a, in, in vitro, in a vitro dish, uh, then examine that it's been done correctly, and then when it's been certified, then reproduce it millions of times and then re-inject it into the patient's bloodstream, and it works its way into the right tissue. So if you modify my heart cells and reject them, uh, at least uh, many of them will end up in my heart, the others will just be discarded. This has actually uh, cured pulmonary hypertension, a fatal disease in animals, and it's been approved for human trials. Uh, and there are many other tech, uh, projects using that technique, and there's some other exciting new techniques for gene therapy. So we'll have not just designer babies, but designer baby boomers, there are many other exciting <laughs> biological processes that take our cells and programming them uh, to be younger, extending the telomeres, correcting DNA errors, uh, correcting things that we'd like to correct in DNA, because as I mentioned, it hasn't changed in thousands of years. Uh, this is a new paradigm of drug development. Most drug development today is using this rational uh, drug design. But the old paradigm is called drug discovery. Some of that was automated, but still, it was a matter of just finding something that happened to work. We had no model or theory as to why it worked. Okay, something as low as blood pressure, we don't know why it does that. And invariably, these drugs were crude tools, they had lots of side effects. We're discovering those now. 99% of the drugs in the market today were done this <coughs> way. The new drugs will be quite different. I mean, a lot of people have the idea that they should avoid drugs because drugs are very crude and have all kinds of side effects. That is true. Of most any drug we find on the market today, that won't be true when we can actually develop very precise, uh, targeted medications that reprogram biology based on real models uh, and simulations of how biology works. We're in the early stages of that, but there are many very exciting examples. Pfizer's torsotropy, uh, which blocks a specific enzyme that's used in a particular stage of atherosclerosis that destroys HCL at a particular point. In uh, phase two trials, it stopped atherosclerosis, which means it would stop heart disease. Uh, personally, I wouldn't hang my head on any one of these developments, although Pfizer is hanging its head on that one. They're betting a billion dollars, which is a record on the phase three trials. But there are thousands of these developments uh, in the pipeline based on our ability now to understand, to simulate, and to reprogram the software processes, the information processes underlying biology. And we see the same exponential progression. Base pair of DNA cost $10 to sequence in 1990. It's a penny today. It's come down very smoothly and exponentially. Uh, the amount of DNA that we've collected, as I mentioned, has doubled every year and that has continued. So now we're sequencing every disease. We're sequencing uh, DNA indicating aging processes. We're sequencing other, other uh, animals. Uh, sequencing, of course, viruses. Uh, and really gaining an information uh, basis for analyzing and reprogramming biology and then being able to prove them out in, in simulations. Another very revolutionary technology is communications. Uh, many different ways to measure that, the amount of data being moved around, the bandwidth, the speed, wireless, uh, wired, op fiber optic, but uh, many different uh, aspects of communication technology and then data traffic, uh, backbone speed, uh, are doubling every year, roughly. Uh, this is the number of hosts on the internet. This is the chart I mentioned earlier. Uh, the internet was doubling. It was only a few tens of thousands of nodes in the, in the 1980s. But doubling every year means multiplying by a thousand in 10 years, a billion in 20 years, a billion in 30 years. Because of this slow second level of exponential growth, it's actually multiplied by a billion in only 25 years. Uh, but it's a very powerful phenomenon. I mean, look what it's done in just 10 years. Uh, the first reference to the World Wide Web in the New York Times was 1993. That's not so long ago. The first reference to blogs were only a few years ago. Uh, a few years ago, Google was an interesting search engine that had no business model, and people were saying that. Internet advertising is a bust. Um, this is that same chart on a linear graph rather than a log, rather than a log graph. So 
look like the internet just came out of nowhere in the mid 1990s. And this is how we experience technology because we live in a linear world. But if we look at these logarithmic trends, you can see these things coming. That's why it's important, if, particularly if you're involved in technology. But since information technology will be encompassing everything that's important ultimately, including things like energy and transportation, I kind of comment on that. Uh, it's important really for everyone to understand this exponential view of, of uh, technical progress. Another exponential trend is miniaturization. Of course, electronics is miniaturizing, but mechanical systems are as well. Uh, these are some illustrations that have been simulated now, and some have been built and from Eric Drexler's 1986 book, uh, Founding the Modern Field of Nanotechnology, which was foreshadowed by Feynman's original comment that uh, he saw nothing in physics that would prevent us from actually building things at the molecular level. I have many examples in the book of impressive projects where people are, in fact, assembling molecules and creating very intricate structures. One scientist builds a little robot that walks with the human like gate at the molecular level. Uh, and there are four major conferences on uh, biological, microelectronic, mechanical systems, biomems, of actually putting blood cell sized devices in the bloodstream, in the bloodstream of patients. These have been experiments in animals, but yet, I mean, a lot of people say, oh, nanobots, it's very futuristic and unrealistic. We're doing it today. Okay, these nanobots, are, I wouldn't call them nanobots yet because they don't have computers or communication with them, but we do have blood cell sized capsules, uh, many of which are nano engineered, which are doing sophisticated and complex things and actually performing diagnostic and therapeutic uh, functions in animals today in these four major conferences on this subject. One scientist actually cured type 1 diabetes in rats with a nano engineered capsule, 7 nanometer pores, lets insulin out in a controlled fashion, blocks antibodies this type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease, and it actually works, and there's now a project actually to build a version of that for human testing. Uh, so blood cell size devices is not as futuristic as it sounds. If you take these other trends that I've showed you uh, into consideration and consider what these uh, blood cell size devices will be capable of in the 2020s, they will be able to have considerable computational and communication resources. It can be on a lot wireless low layer network. Uh, Computers can share their knowledge and their computational resources. A million computers can become one computer uh, when necessary, and then a million again. Uh, so these nanobots will have uh, considerable computational resources as we get to the 2020s. Uh, this is a design that you're looking at of a robotic red blood cell by Rob Friedis. He calls it a respirocyte. It's actually been worked out in considerable detail. Now, a red blood cell is a part of biology that we have reverse engineered. We understand how red blood cells work. We have complete models of them. We have simulations uh, that are actually fairly simple. And it brings up an interesting issue about biology. I mean, you'll hear people say how intricate biology is, and that's true. Uh, some people say how optimal it is. That's absolutely not true. An evolutionary process will make certain assumptions early on, and then uh, it has to live with those assumptions, essentially, although we can come back now to human beings, which we are the result of an evolutionary process and change some of those early assumptions. One of those early assumptions is everything has to be built out of amino acids. Amino acids are a very limited class of three-dimensional structures that can be folded up from a linear sequence of amino acids. Uh, and as we reverse engineer biology, we're seeing that we can, in fact, engineer uh, devices that are thousands and sometimes millions of times more powerful. Uh, this reservoir side, a conservative analysis was done independently and showed if you replaced 10% of your red blood cells with these robotic versions, uh, you could do an Olympic sprint for 15 minutes without taking a breath.
biological neurons that are destroyed by Parkinson's disease are placed by this computer that's surgically installed. The neurons in, that, in the vicinity of the destroyed tissue are now getting signals from the computer, whereas they used to get signals from biological neurons. So they're perfectly happy to do that. The whole system works well. And so now you have a hybrid of biological and non-biological intelligence. And the latest generation of this uh, neural implant allows you to, to download new software to your neural implant from outside the patient. So we, we already have devices in our bodies and brains where we can download software. Uh, we have blood cell size devices. Uh, if you apply these exponential progressions in computation, communication, and simulations of biology, uh, it's quite clear that by the 2020s they will be very, very capable. Um, come back to the exponential growth of computation, extend this through the 21st century. We do have to address the question, I mean, are we aware of specific technologies that can support this ongoing progression? And, and we are. Uh, the first predictions of the demise of Moore's Law were 2002. Uh, Intel now says 2022. But in my view, by 2020, the key features of transistors on an integrated circuit will be a few atoms and with them. We won't be able to shrink them anymore. That will be the end of Moore's Law. But we will then go to the sixth paradigm, which is three-dimensional molecular computing. And that was a controversial notion when my last book, The Age of Special Machines, came out in 1999. I would say that that's uh, pretty much a mainstream view today by informed observers that Warren, of course, will have three-dimensional molecular computing. They're already working at small scale. We have another 15 years to go before we really need them. Uh, there are already very impressive projects and some early harbingers of three-dimensional circuits coming out. We might as well use a third dimension. We live in a three-dimensional world. Our brain, which uses a very slow and cumbersome information processing system, gets its power from being organized in three dimensions. And that's another example, in fact, of the suboptimality of uh, biology. Uh, uh, our interneural connections, which is where our thinking takes place, uh, can compute about 200 digitally controlled analog transactions a second. It's a million times slower than what electronics is capable of. It communicates through chemical gradients move at a few hundred feet per second, that's a million times slower than electronics. So ultimately, uh, three-dimensional electronic circuits will be much more capable from a hardware perspective. And I would say that that's not controversial today. But what is uh, perhaps still uh, more of an interesting question is, will we have the software, or will we just have extremely fast calculators? And that's where this other grand project comes in of understanding the human brain really understanding its principles of operation. It's not, I work in artificial intelligence and we've had only limited input, we've had some, but limited input from brain science to provide methods and tools and algorithms for artificial intelligence. And the reason for that is we haven't been able to see inside the brain up until recently. If I gave you a computer and gave you some crude magnetic sensors you can place outside the box and say, we'll reverse engineer this, you come up with a theory that would be similar to our to fairly recent theories about brain science. Well, okay, when it's storing information, there seems to be some activity over here, and uh, here's some noise in this whole device, and this is where the information is being stored. But we wouldn't really be able to come up with a very good theory of operation. Uh, you wouldn't understand that there's an instruction set, and 122 instructions, and data field, and uh, registers, and so on. Uh, if, on the other hand, I allowed you to put individual sensors on individual signals that could track the signals at sufficient speed, uh, you could reverse engineer it. That's exactly, if you had the training, that's exactly what electrical engineers do when they reverse engineer a competitor's electronic product. Well, we are now getting those tools. Uh, the resolution of brain scanning, 3D volume has been doubling every year. Uh, spatial resolution has been moving as well. Uh, and we are now actually able to see, in vivo, in a living brain, individual internal connections, see them signaling in real time. It's very interesting new scanning technology from the University of Pennsylvania that can do that. Many other emerging scanning technologies that really can provide us the data of, how, of, of seeing the brain work. We can see that not only does the brain create our thoughts, but we can actually see our thoughts create our brain. That's a very interesting way in which the brain has plasticity. Thinking about a particular issue, you're actually developing new brain matter through interesting experiments with teaching people the violin and uh, the neural matter has to do with controlling these four left fingers. Something grows greatly in complexity in the brain. So 
So we don't really create who we are, but we can understand those principles we <coughs> once we understand them. Now, the question comes up, okay, we can get this data, but can we make any sense of it? Is it just going to be this vast amount of incomprehensible data? Doug Hofstadter wonders about that. Maybe our brains are below the threshold uh, necessary to understand our intelligence. Maybe that's a basic uh, rule of complexity. This system will only have a certain amount of complexity and cannot really understand its own principles of operation. And if we were smarter and able to understand our brains, well, then necessarily our brains would be that much more complex and we'd never catch up with it. Now, that is not what we're finding. There are several hundred regions of the brain. We have enough data now uh, on several dozen of those regions to reverse engineer them, to describe how information is encoded in those regions, how it's transformed, how it transmits it, uh, and in what format to other regions. Uh, this is one model and simulation of 15 regions of the auditory cortex done by a team of scientists on the West Coast uh, that Lloyd Watts has organized. And applying psychoacoustic tests to this uh, simulation gets very similar results to applying psychoacoustic tests to human auditory perception. It's being used now and designed for front end speech recognition because it can pick out conversation against a panoply background sound, something that speech recognition software hasn't been able to do. Uh, there's another very interesting simulation of the cerebellum that described quite a few of these experiments in the book. Uh, the cerebellum is significant. This is where we do our skill formation. It comprises more than half the neurons in the brain. And again, the simulation uh, performs tests very similarly to human skill formation. It doesn't prove it's a perfect model, uh, but it does show that we can understand uh, these regions and develop simulations. That brings up an issue of how complicated is the brain? Well, if we take a brain and actually describe all of the internal connections and neurotransmitter concentration patterns, it's, uh, there's a lot of information there. It's thousands of trillions of bytes. But the design of the brain is contained in the genome. And we say, well, wait, you've got to include the, the ribosomes and the genetic machinery. That actually adds very little information. So the whole genome is 800 million bytes, 3 billion runs, 6 billion bits, 800 million bytes. 2% uh, of that codes for protein. The other 98% well, it used to be called junk DNA. We actually understand now it's not junk. It's needed for gene expression. Uh, but it's replete with redundancies. There's one sequence called ALU that's repeated 300,000 times. And if we eliminate all the redundancy, uh, we get 30 to 100 million bytes, probably closer to 30 million bytes. The smaller the Microsoft Word. And <laughs> 20 million bytes of that, approximately 20 to, say, 20 to 40 million bytes, describes the design of the brain. That's a billion times smaller than our estimated amount of information in a brain. How could that be? How could 40 million bytes describe something that's a billion times greater than that? Well, in computer science, we do that all the time. Genetic algorithms, for example, can be fairly compact. They can create millions of copies of themselves. They interact with a complex environment. They evolve a solution to a problem that is more complex than the uh, original design by several orders of magnitude. And that is actually how the brain works. For example, on the cerebellum, uh, the genome has only a few genes, only a few tens of thousands of bytes that describes the wiring of the genome, of the cerebellum, which is half the neurons of the brain. Basically, it says there are four neuron types that are wired like this. Now repeat 10 billion times, and oh, and add a few, a little bit of randomness with each repetition. And then this st stochastically wired cerebellum, which is, has a lot of randomness in it, interacts with the complex environment of the child learns how to walk and talk and catch a fly ball and it gets filled up with meaningful information by interacting with the complex environment. That is basically the paradigm with which the brain works. But the complexity of the design is on the order of 40 million bytes. That's not simple. I'm not saying it's a, it's a, it's a simple system where we don't understand that design yet and the 40 million bytes are highly interactive with each other, but it's a level of complexity that we can manage. And just to, to show you an example, uh, I mean, here's the famous Mandelbrot set. It's a very complex pattern, and as we zoom in on a small piece of it, we see you know, endless complexity at every level. Uh, it seems to be a tremendously complicated uh, entity. The formula for this is six characters long. So to show you how a lot of apparent complexity can emerge from simpler rules, uh, Stephen Wolfram makes the same point. It's fairly simple. Cellular atomic can create a lot of apparent complexity. And it is a cleverly designed system. It evolved to be able to interact with a complex environment and absorb a lot of knowledge and skills, thereby multiplying its own apparent complexity. Uh, if 
we examine the pace with which we're reverse engineering the brain, the size of the simulations, scaling up of detailed models, <coughs> it's a conservative estimate to conclude that we will have detailed models of the principles of operation of the human brain by, by the 2020s. IBM has already put it together, in fact, a very detailed electrical and, and then chemical simulation of the cerebral cortex. Uh, the progress is, is very rapid. And uh, we can then, this will, we won't just necessarily just blindly copy these techniques, it will expand the toolkit in the artificial intelligence field that we can then create comparably complex and capable systems. And it will be a very uh, interesting combination because we'll be able to combine the subtle capabilities of human intelligence, which is largely our pattern recognition capability, with ways in which a thousand dollar computer is already superior to us and can remember billions of facts easily. It can share its knowledge and skills. We spent years training one set of research computers to understand human speech and trained it like a child and automated that with tens of thousands of hours of transcribed speech and it would gradually improve its markup models and neural nets and then finally learn its lessons and do a commercially acceptable level of speech recognition. If you want your personal computer to do the same thing, you don't have to go through that training like you do have to do with every human child. You can just load the evolved patterns of one computer. It's called loading the software. And uh, machines can share their knowledge at electronic speeds. We can share our knowledge too at the speed of language, which is millions of times slower. <coughs> but that was a big step over what animals can do. And despite the discussions of language capabilities of animals, are much more limited. And a unique thing about humans is that we do have this exponentially expanding knowledge base that we pass down from generation to generation and it grows as we pass it down. Uh, no other animal does that. I'll just touch briefly on economic implications, but this is growing uh, our economy. We've gone from $30 to $130 in the value, in constant dollars, in the value of, a rank, of an average hour of human labor because of uh, automation. Uh, and not only does the power of these technologies grow exponentially, like the size of the internet, and the amount of data, and the speed with which you can move it around, but the adoption grows exponentially. I mean, here's e-commerce, smooth, exponential growth. It's now over a trillion dollars. Now you might say, oh, wait a second, wasn't there a boom and a bust somewhere in this uh, progression? That was strictly a capital markets phenomenon. The capital markets, Wall Street looked at the internet and said, wow, this is going to transform every business model. So the value of these uh, companies that had new business models just soared. 18 months later, when all the business models in every industry hadn't been transformed overnight, Wall Street said, oh, I guess that was wrong, and everything went the other way. Meanwhile, there was slow and steady, ex but exponential growth in the adoption of these technologies. And we see this kind of boom-bust psych psychology as a harbinger of true revolutions that happened with the railroads in the 19th century. And it happened with artificial intelligence in the 80s, and it's now happened with uh, the internet and telecommunications. There may be a movement going now with nanotechnology, uh, because really exciting applications of nanotechnology are beyond the six to eight year planning horizon of being told of venture capital. Uh, information technology is 8% of the economy, it's growing exponentially, it will be a majority of the economy by the 2020s. It's already deeply influential in every other aspect of the economy. Uh, let me show you one example of uh, some work we've done. We, we developed the first large vocabulary speech recognition in one of my companies. We put this together with uh, commercial language translation and speech synthesis, which another one of my companies developed the first speech synthesizer. So this is a more recent generation of that. It actually sounds pretty human. In this demonstration, the weakest part is the actual text it's text language translation. But I was at Google the uh, day before yesterday, and they took a data-driven approach. I, mean, I think the most valuable asset Google has is not just its search engine, but its data, because it has these vast databases. And you can create intelligent systems if you have enough data that you can sort of self-organize. They had a team of people develop a Farsi to English translator, and nobody on the team spoke a word of Farsi. And the system actually worked as well as human, professional human translators uh, by actually just finding the patterns in all of these examples of translated uh, text. Uh, so this is a translation system. I've actually used this to talk to people who, in Europe that didn't speak English. I spoke English, they heard me in German. They spoke German, I heard them in English. We were able to converse uh, quite well. Uh, this is a demonstration. Uh, this is an 
eine Demonstration an. We will be able to talk to anyone. Father. Wir werden fähig sein, zu jemandem zu reden. Regardless of their language. Period. Ohne Rücksicht auf ihre Sprache. The rain in Spain. <laughs> La pluie en Espagne. Stays mainly in the plane. Period. Reste dans les plaines principalement. Merci pour votre attention. Period. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>
are on the Army Science Advisory Board, and the Army is very interested in using these technologies to put soldiers in commercial reality environments rather than being inside the weapons. The armed predators really uh, step in that direction, but ultimately it would be taking soldiers out of the weapons. It's a dangerous place to be, uh, and they'll be in virtual reality environments and feel like they're in the weapon. And even if they are in the weapon, like in an Abrams tank, which actually is a safe place to be, there's only been three combat casualties in the last 20 years in Abrams tanks because of a lot of exotic technology, but the soldier can't just look outside the window and see what's going on. So they're in virtual reality environments. But this will be inexpensive, ubiquitous, very high quality, full immersion, high resolution technology early in the next decade. So things like we're doing now, where we feel like we're together in terms of visual, auditory reality, we'll be able to do in these virtual reality spaces that will be ubiquitous, will be online all the time. I actually have a technology teleporter uh, that enables me to be with an audience and actually see them, and they see me, and I look three dimensional. As I move around, they see the local background behind me. I can't wander around like this. I have to stay behind the special podium. But uh, we give presentations around the world, Europe and Asia, using this technology. But it's expensive today. I have to send the technician out. But this will be ubiquitous technology over the next decade. We'll have language translation. We'll have language technologies. We can go British Airways now and have an interesting conversation with their virtual receptionist and talk to her about anything. Always it has to do with making reservations on British Airways, but uh, ultimately these, these virtual personalities will be a continual presence. Search engines won't wait to be asked and <coughs> see if you're struggling with something. You know, that actress, what was her name? Uh, that robot robot would say, oh, Natalie Portman, Queen of Madala, Star Wars 4, 5, and 6. Uh, you can kind of tell the search engine when they're uh, quiet down, but. Uh, <laughs> This, these uh, natural language technologies will be a primary uh, interface. If we go out to 2029, we'll have many turns of the screw in terms of doubling the price performance. In 25 years, I think that's, uh, mm -hmm. that will multiply the price performance, bandwidth, capacity, uh, information technologies, computation, communication, biological technologies, all these different information-based technologies by a factor of a billion. They're already very influential. Uh, we will have completed the reverse engineering of the human brain, but we've expanded the AI toolkit, we'll be able to really apply human levels of pattern recognition together with these natural advantages of machines to share knowledge of electronic speeds, and it'll be a very powerful combination. But in my view, it's not a sort of alien invasion of intelligent machines coming from over the horizon to compete with us. It's emerging from within our civilization. We routinely do intellectual feats today, as I mentioned earlier, that would be impossible without our machines, and we always move on to the next horizon. People say, well, if, you, if everybody can do all these things you struggle with today easily, people won't be motivated. That's not what we find. And today, a mathematician can sit with Mathematica or some other similar program and just easily solve problems that mathematicians 100 years ago you know, would spend months on. That doesn't mean they're sitting and doing nothing. They're working on the next horizon. And we literally will get very intimate with this technology. We will merge with it. We will have billions of nanobots in our bodies and brains keeping us healthy from inside, combating pathogens, uh, directing DNA, RNAs, uh, reversing aging processes. They'll be in our brains uh, the way we have neural implants today, but it will be much more ubiquitous because uh, they'll be non-invasive. They can go through the capillaries. They can create virtual reality environments from within the nervous system. Uh, the scenario there is that the nanobots shut down the signals coming from your real senses replace them with the signals that wouldn't be appropriate for the virtual environment, and then your brain feels like it's in that virtual environment. Uh, the design of new virtual reality environments will be a new art form. Some will be recreations of beautiful spaces like this, or uh, completely imaginary environments that would be impossible in the real world. You can go there with one other person, or a thousand other people, have any kind of uh, encounter involving all five senses with other people. Uh, people will transmit their whole flow of sensory experiences at the neurological crawls of their emotions out of the web. The way people now beam their images from their webcams, they call them experience beamers, and you can plug in and experience what it's like to be someone else. Uh, there'll be interesting archive experiences that you can experience or interact with. That'll be another new art form. Uh, most significantly, uh, it'll be an expansion of human intelligence. We'll be able to expand our memories our rational functions, our pattern recognition, uh, we'll be able to really very 
very directly expand our uh, intelligence. Uh, we do that today routinely if only AI programs, narrow AI programs, would stop today our economic infrastructure would come to a halt. You could get money from your bank, communication would stop, most transportation would stop. That wasn't true 30 years ago. Uh, this artificial intelligence permeating our modern infrastructure today. Uh, you get a diagnosis, automated diagnosis from, a, from the electric cardiogram, from blood cell images, uh, AI programs flying land airplanes, guided intelligent weapons, make a trillion dollars of investment decisions in the stock market, automatically detect credit fraud, fraud, and there's hundreds of other examples of things that were research projects in AI 15 years ago. I call them narrow AI because they perform specific functions that used to require human intelligence and can now be done actually very often better by these machines. Uh, but they're narrow because they don't have the flexible, supple, subtle, broad intelligence of human beings. Uh, but that will change and we will actually expand our own human intelligence through this intimate merger with our intelligence. Uh, and this has far-ranging implications. Uh, the book that I came out with last year that I co-authored with Terry Grossman and the longevity expert in Denver uh, talks about three uh, bridges to radical life extension. Bridge one is what we know right now, and we can really aggressively overcome aging and disease processes. Uh, I had type 2 diabetes 20 years, two years ago, but I have no indication of diabetes. I had a uh, predisposition to heart disease. My father died at 58 or 57. Um, but he was like plus 280, that's 130. I have no indication of that disease. Uh, I have a lot of biological aging tests indicate I'm aging pretty slowly. Uh, we can really overcome genetic dispositions, certainly to disease, <coughs> how we maintain the aging processes as well. People say I was 80% in the genes. That's only true if you follow the sort of uh, watered down recommendations that come from our health authorities. If you're aggressive about reprogramming your biochemistry, you can really overcome these dispositions. We need to do that because when our genes evolved 30,000 years ago, it was not in the interest of the species for people to live past childbearing. That meant age 30. So average life expectancy was you know, the best in your 20s. Otherwise, you're just using up the precious resources of the tribe. Uh, every time we've had technological advances, we've progressed in human longevity. It was only 37 in 1800. So sanitation, antibiotics, those were big technical advances. Uh, we've doubled life expectancy in, in two centuries. Uh, it's not going to take another two centuries to double it again because of this exponential growth. The next major technology, uh, bridge two, is the mastering of the information processes in biology, biotechnology revolution. That will really reach its maturity in 10 or 15 years. I believe we will have overcome things like heart disease and cancer and diabetes, at least turn them into chronic conditions. We, there are about a dozen different aging processes we understand. A number of them already will be able to reverse those. That will be a bridge to the third bridge, the nanotechnology revolution will go beyond the limitations of biology. Uh, and that really will lead to radical life extension. So if you can uh, take care of yourself the old-fashioned way for another 10 years, uh, you may actually experience this uh, remarkable century ahead. So just <coughs> I'll end with a brief comment about the importance of long-term Planning. The first thing is to really appreciate this exponential view. Uh, the next century will be quite remarkable, let alone 10,000 years. We'll make more than 10,000 years of progress at the year 2000 rate uh, in this century. Uh, by the 2040s, which is the date I'm going to put for the quote singularity, uh, meaning a radical transformation of, of the reality of human existence, uh, the amount of Non-biological intelligence we create that year will be billions of times more powerful than all biological intelligence that exists today. Once non-biological intelligence gets a foothold in our brains, uh, it will expand exponentially. That doesn't mean it's self-replicating, but that's just the nature of the power of these information technologies. The crossover point will be in the late 2020s, in the 2030s, and 2040s, it will come to predominate. In my view, it's still human intelligence. Uh, in my view, human means uh, the species that expands our horizons. We can stand around, we can stay on the planet, we can stay with the limitations of our biology, uh, and we won't stay uh, with the limitations of, of our biological thinking either. Uh, so the end of the century will be uh, remarkably different.
different uh, reason. Uh, this is called singularity. It's just a metaphor of physics. So it's very hard to see beyond the event horizon of this radical transformation. We can describe it in mathematical terms and say, well, we'll be billions, trillions of times more intelligent. Uh, it's very hard to describe what that means. Uh, just as it's very hard to describe what's going, what goes on in a black hole, because we can't see inside a black hole. But we do have enough rational thinking to actually make intelligence comments about what it's like inside a black hole, even though we've never been inside one. And we can do a uh, similar mental exercise with regard to the dramatic transformation that humanity will see uh, in this century. Uh, this is not a utopian vision, because it's both promise and peril. Uh, we don't have to go further in the 20th century to see tremendous amount of destruction amplified by technology, and these are very powerful uh, 21st century technologies. Uh, we will have the opportunity to, to do things like overcome poverty. The latest United Nations report shows actually significant progress in that. Poverty has been cut in half in the last 10 years in Asia. Uh, the World Bank projects it will be cut by 90% by 2015. There's been similar progress all around the world except in Sub-Saharan Africa. We do see, however, uh, progress even there in terms of this exponential growth of the price performance of information technologies like AIDS drugs cost thirty thousand dollars ten years ago per patient per year didn't work very well and now they work pretty well in Africa now down to hundred dollars per patient per year still more than we'd like and we'd like to do, we should be doing more but at least we actually have the technological tools to do more now because of this uh, law of accelerating return uh, we'll be able to overcome things like biological disease with nanotechnology but that will introduce its own dangers uh, in terms of uh, self potential for self replicating nanotechnology I've had argue, arguments with people like Rob Friedman about do we really need self-replicating nanotechnology. I agree. I, I believe we do, if for no other reason but to protect ourselves from self-replicating. <laughs> <laughs> so what's going to protect us from that? Ultimately, strong AI will have these very intelligent systems that can protect us from pathological nanotechnology. What will, have, what will protect us from uh, pathological AI? Well, intelligent AI. <laughs> 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 it's a little bit like that story of the universe sitting on the back of a turtle, and what is that sitting on? It's another turtle, and this turtle is all the way down. Uh, but how to protect ourselves from pathological AI is actually probably the most important question that we're facing. We do have a new existential risk that didn't exist 40 years ago. It's not just atomic weapons. In fact, it's something more formidable. At a routine college laboratory, the means and the tools exist to create a bioengineered biological virus. Uh, all the models show that would be much worse than an atomic bomb. Uh, and the tools and the knowledge to do this is much more widespread. That's an existential risk. People wonder, well, why do we make more preparations for 9-11 and more preparations for Katrina? Well, here's a very profound danger uh, that people are doing anything about. Uh, I've given some testimony to Congress and proposed uh, that we have a major program to put a rapid response system in place uh, that would uh, consist of RNA interference. We'd sequence a new virus quickly, uh, create an RNA interference-based medication, and then uh, rapidly uh, gear up production. That's something we could put in place. We should do that. It will naturally come about anyway, but it'll take years longer than if we have a Manhattan-style project to do it. Uh, so. The increase in power of these technologies, I believe, is inexorable. How we apply them is not. Uh, the future is still in our hands. Uh, whether these things get applied to promise of peril, whether we have prepared the defenses for inevitable peril that uh, some malevolent use will present, uh, will really depend on the priorities that we set. Thank you very much.
Is there any kind of information or knowledge work that is not growing exponentially? Well, we do see technologies that are at the flat asymptote of an S curve, things like energy and uh, transportation. Uh, there are some increases of performance that have come from information technology. The aircraft has been coming down somewhat. And, uh, we can distribute energy somewhat more efficiently. But uh, there will be new S curves, particularly when we can apply intelligence and information processes to the organization of matter and energy in the form of nanotechnology. Uh, we converted 0.03% of the sunlight that falls on the Earth uh, to energy. We mean all of our projected needs for 2030. We will actually be able to do that uh, in the 2020s uh, with nano engineered solar panels that will be highly efficient, lightweight, easy to install, and, and very inexpensive. We'll also ultimately be able to produce almost anything uh, at almost no material cost, really just the cost of the information. We'll be able to store that energy in highly distributed nano engineered fuel cells that are decentralized and therefore not subject to the dangers of the highly decentralized energy sources we have now. Uh, so, not everything is information technology. Uh, I can't really think of forms of information technology that haven't addressed the people will come up with examples of what about word processing that hasn't changed. Uh, there are always mature technologies that have really fulfilled their niche and there aren't improvements there. I mean, just like in the Cambrian explosion, there was this rapid evolution of body plans, but then that became a mature technology. There was no reason to improve them. They had reached a fairly optimal point. That didn't mean evolution stopped. It went to a higher level than concentrated in higher cognitive function. So we have, we're not making much improvement in, in word processing. It's arguable whether we're making progress in operating systems, but we are working on higher levels of more intelligent software that encompasses more and more uh, of our uh, industrial infrastructure. Okay. Here's a second question from uh, Camilo uh, Ramirez. Um, so how, how do we know that the singularity has arrived? Are we going to be aware of it? Or will, like a neuron in a brain, will it just bypass our intellect? In other words, um, if, if the singularity is near, how can we prove that it actually came? Uh, I have dialogues in the book and uh, says that she'll know the singularity is here when she has a million emails in her, in her inbox. <laughs> By that measure, we're almost, we're almost there. <laughs> and it's a good question whether we'll <coughs> notice it. Uh, if you catch the event horizon of a of a singularity of a black hole, uh, as far as physics is concerned, you actually don't notice it. Uh, there's no sign that it since you've gone beyond the point of no return. Um, and you know, some theories of the singularity have these capabilities going infinite. And I had actually an interesting mathematical dialogue with Hans Moravec on what the underlying formulas were for this growth of uh, this exponential growth. A subtle change in the formula does have it actually explode into a true mathematical singularity when you're going to an infinite level at a finite amount of time, which I don't believe. Uh, and in the back of the book, there's is this discussion of exactly where that point is. Uh, but in my view, it's growing by double exponential, meaning that it will reach fantastic levels by today's perspective, but still finite. And by some measures, today's technology is fantastic by the standards of say, 200 years ago. Uh, so it will be very, truly transformative. Uh, the Accelerated Change Conference this Saturday uh, they described all these two types of singularitarians as the hard takeoff singularitarians, and then there's the more conservative soft takeoff ones, and I was put in that camp. Uh, so it's nice to get a conference where I was the conservative. <laughs> <laughs> so here's another question from Dan um, Wertemeyer. Um, is weapons technology growing exponentially? Will an individual be able to kill a billion people for a few dollars? <laughs> well, it's actually a serious, it's a serious question uh, because of the leverage that these technologies provide. And that's, of course, the concern. Uh, I don't know about a few dollars, but you know, maybe a few hundred thousand dollars, you can get the equipment to, to do what I described earlier, uh, which could kill many levels of people in terms of creating fire to the biological virus. Uh, so that, and when we 
get uh, self-replicating nanotechnology, we'll have similar concerns there. Uh, so that was actually a source of concern that underlying Bill Joy's uh, why the future doesn't need his cover story for wiring. Uh, and that sort of stemmed from this borrowing discussion I had with Bill Joy in September 1998 in Lake Tahoe. Uh, actually, we're heading back to Lake Tahoe this weekend. So <laughs> The concern is real, uh, and it's led some people to say, well, it's a labor technology, not all technology, just those dangerous ones, like biotechnology and nanotechnology. I pointed out that that's pretty much all the technology. <laughs> <laughs> Shrinking technology and exponential rates, everything will be you know, down to the sub-100 nanometer uh, key feature range within 20 years. Uh, you'd have to really labor all the technology uh, to relinquish those dangerous technologies. And you can't keep the, the safe ones. Actually, uh, Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, makes this point. And actually, a pretty well written uh, Unabomber manifesto, uh, where he says, uh, you can't get rid of the good parts without the bad parts, because they're all intertwined. And the same technology that will cure cancer also can empower this bioengineer, the bioengineer, pathological virus, bioterrorist. Uh, so Kaczynski says, get rid of all of it. Uh, more responsible voices have said similar things. Uh, uh, Bill McKibben, who came up with uh, the concept of global warming, uh, in his book, uh, recent book, says we've had enough. Technology has been great, but let's stop now. Uh, <laughs> which I think is ultimately an irresponsible position and also an untenable one, aside from the fact that you need a totalitarian state as in the not, not a break in the world to enforce that, it would just drive the technologies underground where it would be even less stable. And this concern came up when uh, software viruses first emerged some 20 years ago. The comments were made, well, okay, these aren't sophisticated, but ultimately when we have a big internet and we'll have very sophisticated software viruses, it's going to totally destroy world communication. And part of that prediction was, was correct. They have become very sophisticated. It's very interesting to read how clever some of them are, depositing eggs in various places and then triggering them and, and so on. But the, the immune system, the technological immune system that we put in place, has actually been very effective. And it's a good example of a new human designed, self, uh, self perpetuating, self reproducing pathogen, the software virus, uh, that we've actually done a very good job. Generally, within hours, at most a day or two, a new augmentation of the technological immune system emerges to deal with these new threats. And the internet is going to be brought down for even a few seconds. We can do half as well uh, with biological viruses and self-replicating nanotechnology. We'll be doing very well. And the lesson there is that this is in a completely open system. There's no certification of practitioners in, in software. There's no certification of products. It's a completely unregulated industry, despite the fact that software is very influential and it's used in things like intensive care units and flying airplanes. And there's no certification. Uh, there is some big health technologies. Uh, but this sort of self-organizing system has worked very well. Uh, some of the uh, specters described in Bill Joy's article are taking these future uh, dangers as if they were foisted on today's completely unprepared work. Uh, I do think we need to put a few extra stones on the defensive side of the equation. We do need to anticipate things like uh, the potential for bioterrorism, not just bioterrorism as in smallpox and anthrax, but actually design bioterrorism. Uh, we need to anticipate these things. Uh, but uh, these, these specters do exist, and I think it's actually the most important problem facing humanity is to uh, prepare the defenses for these existential risks. Okay. Um, this is a one version of many people's questions. This one's by Janine Weber. Um, what will happen when the paradigm of exponential growth collides with the brick wall of finite natural resources? Well, we have plenty of natural resources. Um, if we have nanotechnology and uh, effective artificial intelligence to utilize them, uh, with nanotechnology we can keep reorganizing the matter and energy that we have to meet the material needs of even a greatly expanding human biological population that may occur when we significantly decrease the death rate. We'll be able to create virtually any physical product just from these information resources by reorganizing the atoms and molecules and 
in our vicinity. And <coughs> earlier, the capacity of matter and energy to support computation and communication is really vast and will enable us to increase our intelligence by uh, a factor of many trillions. Uh, so we have plenty of resources. Uh, the actual amount of physical resources needed is smaller and smaller. <coughs> the computers have gotten smaller and smaller as they've gotten more and more powerful. Uh, that will continue to where we have very you know, tiny computers. Uh, I mean, the electronics industry, as influential as it is, uses very little energy, uses very little material resources. Uh, so that is not uh, really a limitation to what I'm talking about. Um, this is from Stuart Brand. Um, in this uh, arena of uh, ever accelerating exponential growth, what should remain slow? Amore. <laughs> I'm not sure I can think of very much, uh, because I think we ultimately will speed up our, our thinking process. Uh, and we could say you know, contemplation and meditation and so on, but we'll be able to do that quickly also. <laughs> Exactly. But we'll, we'll change our subjective appreciation of time. So, short period of time may seem like a long period of time. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I heard the word sex, so here's another question from Arthur Young. How do you see the law of accelerating, re accelerating returns affecting sexual gratification? Uh, I see it affecting it a lot. I mean, these communication technologies have always uh, been used for. Uh, sexual communication and interest. I was always been an early adopter of technology. I mean, uh, Gutenberg's first book was the Bible, but then there was a whole century of more purian themes. And certainly we apply it to movies and film and uh, other forms of virtual reality. Uh, not everybody finds telephone sex to be uh, satisfactory, but uh, when we add more senses to virtual reality, we'll be able to relate to each other in virtual reality environments, uh, particularly when we have full immersion virtual reality encompassing all the senses. We'll be able to do that crudely, actually, uh, early in the next decade. We will have full immersion visual auditory virtual reality, which will be interesting, but we'll have forms of tactile communication as well. I've actually just filed five patents on that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, when we get to full sense. immersion virtual reality within the nervous system, we really will be able to have any kind of interaction with anyone in these virtual environments, uh, and there's a lot of advantages. Obviously, there's safety advantages, uh, various biological problems like pregnancy or STDs are so not going to be an issue in virtual reality. Uh, you can hang up on virtual reality. Uh, in town, you can hang up on a telephone call, which is auditory virtual reality. Uh, and you don't have to be the same <laughs> You can project yourself as someone else. Couple can change themselves into each other and see these relationships from each other's perspective. Because the person that you project yourself at might be overridden by your partner and may choose to see you as someone else. We do this in our imaginations now, but uh, the virtual thing will be much more real than, than our imagination. Uh, so here's, here's a question from um, Art Carver. If you were a student now, say in college or graduate school, what field would you enter? Well, I, you know, human knowledge, which as I mentioned, is a unique attribute of the human species. And I think the purpose of life uh, is to expand human knowledge. There's nothing more profound than being able to create some knowledge that has some power, whether it's uh, my daughter's field of interest, which is choreography or mathematics, or computer science, or <coughs> literature, or music. Uh, that is, that is uh, what's truly exciting. Uh, you and I were chatting before this presentation about how we feel and we transcend our bodies. And 
But when we create knowledge, we are transcending our bodies. We're not worrying about our biological bodies. We are going to enter the world of ideas. That is actually what the future horizon will be. We'll have far greater power to create ideas. And we'll also be able to project bodies when we want them and need them. Uh, but so in order to create knowledge, you need passion. You need know, lots of commencement speakers say, follow your passion. But I do think that is the right advice to find something that you're passionate about. Uh, and all forms of knowledge are important. Uh, it is important, I think, to understand science and technology because that still is the cutting edge of, of these advances. Uh, if someone has any interest in technology, I think math is very important because it is the language of science and technology. It continues to be remarkable to, remarkable to me how powerful math is. I actually think it's a very sexy subject. Actually, here's another uh, question from Stuart Brain. I have a lot of questions tonight. Um, earlier in your talk, you said that the singularity was just a metaphor. So what's really going on? <laughs> I didn't use the word gut. <laughs> the word is a metaphor. Uh, but it will be a very real historical transformation. Uh, and it is a metaphor because, as I mentioned, uh, we can't clearly see beyond the event horizon, but we can use our intelligence, it is beyond that threshold, where we describe things even if we haven't experienced them and many of their implications. But it will be more remarkable than what we can talk about today because we will have millions of people amplified by our technology for all this period of time, coming up with very creative ways to use this technology. And nobody thought of blogs you know, five, six years ago. Okay. I'll use the host prerogative of asking the last question. Um, in one of your, your books, you use the word um, spirituality. So, um, what do you understand by the word God? Well, it's a three letter word. <laughs> <laughs> and it's described with many stories and metaphors and, uh, in different religious traditions, but they all do have a few things in common. They describe God, whether it's uh, the cranky old man making agreements with people or um, uh, Star Wars like force that sort of permeates the universe. They all describe God as being infinite in knowledge, creativity, uh, beauty, and love, and knowledge, and all knowing. Uh, so it's an ideal of infinite levels of these attributes. Well, what do we find uh, in an evolutionary process? We find that entities grow in knowledge, creativity, intelligence uh, that become more beautiful than we do. If you look at the history of of, say, biological evolution. Uh, if you look at entities that are undergoing uh, evolution in a genetic algorithm, they become more beautiful. Uh, they become ultimately more capable of subtle uh, intelligence and being able to understand emotional qualities like love, so they become more loving. Uh, so they're moving towards greater levels of these attributes which are attributed to God without limit. Uh, so they're moving in a spiritual direction and they actually explode exponentially. So they ultimately become vastly uh, powerful in terms of these attributes which are attributed to God, uh, as I said, without limit. Uh, that they don't actually become infinite in an exponential uh, evolutionary process, but they do uh, appear to be virtually infinite from our current limited perspective. Uh, ultimately, when we can sort of saturate the matter and energy in our vicinity and ultimately beyond our solar system with these supremely powerful, intelligent uh, uh, resources that encompass our emotional intelligence. Uh, it will be vast levels of these of these qualities uh, that we attribute to God. So that's becoming godlike as, as much as we can imagine with any sort of scientifically grounded process. And the other aspect of Spirituality that's relevant to, to these considerations is consciousness. Uh, we have entities that we attribute consciousness to, which are human beings at least seem conscious. And uh, because we have debates about whether other entities are conscious, some people say animals are not conscious, they're just operating by instinct and some kind of quality. Other people uh, say that higher level animals are conscious. I think my cat is conscious. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, we don't have an agreement on that, uh, and we're really just making an assumption about other human beings. Uh, 
Uh, we will also have to have fully non-biological entities that claim to be conscious. Okay, we have them today, uh, characters in your kids' video games who claim to be conscious, to be angry or sad. We're not very convincing today because they don't have the subtle cues that we associate with really having those emotions. But the essence of my prediction is that in a few decades, these entities will be as complex as human intelligence. They'll be based on the reverse engineering of human intelligence. They will be convincing. Uh, they will have the subtle cues. They will say they're conscious have feelings, and uh, this is not a philosophical statement, but more of a political prediction. We will come to accept them as being conscious. Don't get mad at us if we don't accept it. Anyway, they're going to be us, because as I said, they're going to evolve into merging with our technology. And it's a very, a lot of some scientists say, well, it's not really a scientific question, therefore, it's an illusion, it doesn't exist. My feeling is it's actually the most important question. I agree it's not a scientific question, ultimately. Uh, sometimes these discussions evolve into discussions of neurology or uh, objective criteria. But really, whether or not an entity is conscious of what it's feeling uh, cannot be fully penetrated. It's the difference between science, which is objective real, uh, observations and analytical deductions from that, from that, and subjective experience, which is a synonym for, for consciousness. But we are really basically just a pattern. Uh, to say, no, you're really this stuff here. But this stuff here is completely different than it was a few weeks ago. Uh, most of the cells in our body completely are destroyed and are regrown within a matter of months. The neurons are not, but the, the components of the neurons, the filaments, the tubules, all the different components are actually changed. Some within a few days, some within a few months. are completely different stuff than it was a few months ago. So what has continuity? Well, it's, it's the pattern of information. It's just like the pattern that water makes in a stream, you can look at this pattern around the rocks, and it's a very similar pattern. It stays stable for months, maybe changes a little. But obviously, the water that makes it up changes every few milliseconds. So we are a pattern. So what if we capture that pattern and just translate everything that's salient about it into some other substrate? Should be the same thing. But uh, well, we're going to have very interesting philosophical discussions about that. In my view, if we capture the patterns that are important, uh, and if we are in fact conscious, then these new entities will be conscious. So we'll be expanding consciousness. It's another spiritual process. Ray will be signing books in the back if you haven't. Thank you so much.